Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Read the Right Thing. I'm your host, Eric. Jonathan Leatham is an American author from Brooklyn, New York. He's popular for blending genres, especially in his first few books. His first novels blended crime and science fiction genres. I was originally intrigued with this story because I saw the movie starring Edward Norton. The movie is good. I mean, it wasn't my favorite at the time. I wouldn't even put it in my top five of that year. But the acting, the jazz music, and New York City setting made it an enjoyable film. And Edward Norton really nails the character of Lionel. I wasn't planning on reading this book. And then one day while I was browsing a bookstore in downtown Salt Lake, I saw it and I thought, what the hell, let's give it a shot. And I'm glad I picked it up. Leatham is one of those authors that really stopped me in my tracks with his writing style. I would stop and just think at how good he is at writing. The sentences, the descriptions, his style of writing, it's so beautiful and enjoyable to read. I would stop and think like, damn, that was a good sentence. Or a beautiful sequence of real snappy dialogue. I think the last time I did that was with Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. He really stopped me in my tracks. I kept having to reread sentences just because they were so good. To the point where I, I, started not being a, I started not being able to keep track with the story just because I would reread sentences and parts of, the, parts of the book that I thought were written so well. The plot of Motherless Brooklyn didn't necessarily intrigue me and keep me reading. It was Lethem's writing as well as the characters and their insights into a world that I really never experienced before. I used to live in Hoboken, New Jersey, so I used to live by New York City and I visited Brooklyn frequently, but I never saw this type of Brooklyn. The main character is Lionel Esrog. He's an orphan turned detective, and he also suffers from Tourette's. Lethem really captures, I would assume, what it is like to live with Tourette's syndrome. The constant motion or commotion in your head, the inability to stop your own compulsions and impulses, that's exactly what this character is like. Lionel almost constantly experiences urges and ticks, whether to touch something, count something, throw something, or shout something. Lethem said that many readers with Tourette's assume that Lethem itself had Tourette's just because the character was written so well and so truthfully. So let's get into the plot of this book. In the first chapter, Lionel's on a stakeout with one of his colleagues. And this book starts out as most traditional detective stories start out on a stakeout. After that, the book doesn't necessarily follow the traditional plot points of the detective novel. When the boss and also the stand-in paternal figure for Lionel and his colleagues, Frank Minna, is stabbed and died in a hospital, one of Lionel's colleagues ends up in jail, the other two vie for his position, and Frank's widow skips town. And also Lionel attempts to solve this mystery of who killed their boss, their father figure, the person who pulled them out of the orphanage, Frank Minna, who killed Frank Minna. The next chapter, we really get the backstory of Lionel and the other orphans. They grew up in St. Vincent's home for the boys and ended up working for small time gangster Frank. Most interesting part of this novel, for me at least, wasn't necessarily the plot or the whodunit murder mystery. The plot is somewhat predictable and just a vehicle for Lethem's characters and humor to jump out on the page. Really the character, the observations, the humor, the interactions, that's what drives the story. That's what keeps you turning the pages. Lionel's impulses almost make for a type of devil character, I would say, a Jekyll and Hyde, if you will. Not saying that his Tourette side is evil, it just adds a bit of humor and sadness to Lionel. In some instances, you really laugh at Lionel's tics, and I think he also sort of laughs at himself, but then in other instances, you just feel for the guy. You never know how Lionel will morph a normal conversation into mush and a never-ending sequence of weird phrases. So it's the characters that held my interest. Even Frank Mena, who was only in the story for a short time. In one part of the book, Frank talks about the type of woman that he prefers, and it was really funny. He says he favors big-chested gals because a woman has to have a certain amount of muffling, otherwise you ride up against her naked soul. It's that type of observations that make you think and you think, man, how come I can't think of things like that to put on the page? That's the type of sentence that would stop me and I would just think how good it was. It's perfect for someone like Frank to say. I love how Lethem makes these little observations through his characters. Anytime the novel threatens to get a little too detective story cliche, something else usually happens. The novel even makes observations about the cliche detective story a few times. Like when Lionel gets hit in the head with a gun. It says, 
So many detectives have been knocked out and fallen into such strange, swirling darknesses. Such manifold, surrealist voids. And yet, I have nothing to contribute to this painful tradition. There's a YouTube video of Lethem talking about the cinematic influences that had a direct impact on his writing style. He mentions movies from the classic Hollywood canon like Hitchcock's Vertigo, but then he also mentions a few other off-kilter films. And you can definitely see those influences in Motherless Brooklyn. There's a bit of classic 50s and 60s detective noir, but the nature of the main character skews the story so it's not a carbon cut copy of a 50s and 60s detective story. For me, I didn't feel a sense of mystery or suspense that other detective noir novels bring. Maybe that was because I was more interested in the characters and the writing style. But I feel like Lethem was less concerned with suspense than writing imaginative characters, dialogue, and imagery. I also love the descriptions of New York City. New York is a popular setting for books and movies, and if, done, if not done well, it can get kind of tired. I love the descriptions of Brooklyn and Manhattan and the neighborhood. Minas Court Street was the old Brooklyn, a placid, ageless surface alive underneath with talk, with deals, and casual insults. A neighborhood political machine with pizzeria and butcher shop bosses and unwritten rules everywhere. All was talk except for what mattered most, which were unspoken understandings. The barbershop, where he took us for identical haircuts that cost $3 each, except even that fee was waived from Minna. No one had to wonder why the price of a haircut hadn't gone up since 1966, nor why six old barbers were working, mostly not working, out of some ancient storefront, where the barbicide hadn't been charged since the product's invention. In Brooklyn, the jar bragged, where other somewhat younger men passed through constantly to argue sports and wave away offers of haircuts. The barbershop was a retirement home, a social club, and front for a backroom poker game. The barbers were taken care of because this was Brooklyn, where people looked out. Why would the prices go up when nobody walked in who wasn't part of this conspiracy, this trust? Though if you spoke of it, you'd surely meet with confused denials or laughter and a too hard cuff on the cheek. Another exemplary mystery was the arcade, a giant storefront paneled with linoleum containing three pinball machines, which were in constant use, and six or seven video games, asteroids, froggers, centipede, all pretty much ignored, and a cashier who changed dollars to quarters and accept $100 bills folded into lists of numbers, names of horses, and football teams. The curb in front of the arcade was lined with Vespas, which had been in vogue a year or two before but now sat permanently parked without anything more than a bicycle lock for protection, a taunt to vandals. A block away on Smith, they would have been stripped, but here they were, pristine, a curbside Vespa showroom. It didn't need explaining, this was Court Street. And Court Street, where it passed through Carroll Gardens and Cobble Hill, was the only Brooklyn, really. North was Brooklyn Heights, secretly a part of Manhattan. South was the harbor. And the rest, everything east of Gowanus Canal, the only body of water in the world, Minna would crack each and every time we drove over it, that was 90% guns. Apart from small outposts of civilization in Park Slope and Windsor Terrace, was an unspeakable barbarian tumult. I've always wanted to live in a place like that. And it's kind of sad if you look at the Brooklyn now. I don't know if there's streets that exist like that anymore. To me, that was a great description of Brooklyn. Love how the streets were left unchanged. Everywhere else was evolving, but there were still these little pockets of old time gangster streets. I'm gonna do a quick bonus review for you comparing this book to the movie starring Edward Norton. If you're thinking about seeing the movie before reading the book or reading the book before seeing the movie, then I recommend you do it. First off, the stories are completely different. The only things Edward Norton kept from the book seems to be the characters and the very beginning of the story. Everything else is completely different. There's a different time period. The book is set in the 90s, while the movie is set in the 50s. I think Edward Norton thought this detective noir style would just seem out of place if they kept it in the 90s. It works in the book, but it may have just looked too funny in a movie. There's also different music. The movie has a great jazz soundtrack and is one of the main reasons to see it. In the movie, Lionel visits a jazz club that was probably my favorite scene. And in the book, Lionel doesn't listen to jazz music, but he loves Prince. Lionel also thinks that Prince's music has teretic energies. There's even a part of the book where he says, I don't know whether the artist formerly known as Prince is teretic or obsessive compulsive in his human life, but I know for certain he's deeply so in the life of his work. Music has never made such an impact on me until the day in 1986 when sitting in the passenger seat of Menace Cadillac, I first heard the single Kiss squirting its manic way out of the car radio. 
To that point in my life, I might have once or twice heard music that toyed with feelings of claustrophobic discomfort and expulsive release, and which is so doing passingly charmed my Tourette's, golded with a sense of recognition, like Art Carney or Daffy Duck. But here was a song that lived entirely in that territory, guitar and voice twitching and throbbing, writhing obsessively, delineated bounds, alternately silent and explosive. It's so pulsed with Tourette's energies that I could surrender to its tormented squeaky beat and let my syndrome live outside my brain for once, live in the air instead. The movie also doesn't give Lionel's background, so all of chapter two is, is missing. But I think both the book and the movie were good and are worth looking into. If you think this is something you're interested in, I would definitely check them both out. Well, that was my review of Motherless Brooklyn by Jonathan Lethem. I really love this book. To me, this was definitely the right thing. I love any books that stops me in my tracks and you can really read the sentences and just think, man, that was a beautiful sentence. Or this imagery is, a, is amazing. This dialogue is snappy and funny. So if you found this review helpful, hit that like button, leave a comment, tell me what you thought. If you wanna see more reviews, go ahead and subscribe. I post videos usually weekly.